gender equality issues at Education International, which is a global federation for teachers and education support personnel, unions and organizations. Um, I'd like to say first and foremost, this is a safe and respectful space for everybody to share ideas and interact with each other as much as possible. Um, during the last webinar, unfortunately, we did have some trolling in the chat box. So if we see that again, we'll have to disable the, the chat box. But fingers crossed, hopefully that won't happen this time around. So there'll be, as you saw on the slide just now, interpretation into English, French, Spanish, Arabic, Russian, Japanese, Korean, and Hindi. For Arabic speakers, please tune to the Chinese channel. And for Hindi speakers, please tune to the German channel. Um, for all questions and answers, I'd like to invite you to use the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen for the questions that you want to put to the speakers. And for all other general comments, chats, messages that you would like to share with us or with any of the technical team, please use the chat box. But do try to keep those to what's strictly necessary because messages can get lost as many, many people are saying hello and nice to see you. It is very lovely to see all of you, but we also want to catch any of the messages that you're putting into the chat box. Thank you very much. So this is the third, as I mentioned just now, in a series of webinars that the global unions have been organizing to address the issues that have been impacting women workers in the context of COVID-19 pandemic and beyond. The webinars have featured speakers from unions representing workers across all regions. During the first webinar, which was entitled COVID-19, Women Workers in the Front Lines, the speakers illustrated the ways in which the outbreak is exacerbating the existing gender inequalities in all sectors and in all societies. The speakers highlighted the work that trade unions have been trying to do to amortize some of those impacts. In the second webinar, entitled Stopping Gender-Based Violence in the Midst of a Pandemic, Speakers highlighted the ways in which the exponential rise in gender-based violence during the lockdowns have been experienced by women across all sectors. Again, there were some strong calls for the urgency now to ratify ILO Convention 190 on gender-based violence uh, in the world of work. And we can happily report that Uruguay has been the first country to do that from beginning to end. So they've deposited the, uh, the articles of the ILO. We need one more country to do the same so that the convention comes into force. So I urge all of you, please step up your activism so your country can be the next one and we can have this very important instrument in place. So we will have um, some panelists. We've got six main speakers um, and three interventions from the floor. Uh, the initial panelist speakers will make an intervention of five minutes each. Then we'll take some of the questions coming in through the Q&A box. We'll have some responses from the speakers then. And then we'll go back to the speakers who are going to give shorter three minute interventions from the floor, have another round of Q&A before we wrap up. So without further ado, I'd like to call on our first speaker, Ms. April, Sim April Sims, who is Secretary Treasurer of the Washington State Labor Council for the American Federation of Labor and Congress of Industrial Organizations, the AFL-CIO. Thank you so much for being with us. I think nobody here listening or watching this webinar can be oblivious to what's happening in your country and the spark that it's lit right across the world. We're seeing unprecedented le levels of activism focusing around the issues of Black Lives Mattering, the need for you know, racial injustice, discrimination and inequality to be done away with. Um, I wonder if you could say to us something about what hope and opportunities this current moment um, brings for transformational change and for a new normal? And what can trade unions do and what should they be doing to make that a reality? Well, good morning. Thank you so much for having me. Any uh, time I get to spend uh, time with my sisters and my siblings in the struggle, it's a good day. So I'm excited to be joining you from Seattle, Washington. I want to start first, though, by acknowledging that I am on indigenous land. I'm on the traditional land of my native sisters, brothers, and siblings, the first people of Tacoma, the Puyallup tribe. And I want to honor with respect and gratitude their elders past and present for their stewardship of this land and its people, 
I thank them for allowing me to do my work and to live on their land. And I would invite you all to consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, migration, and settlement that bring us all into our spaces today. And hope that you will consider uncovering these truths at all of your public events moving forward. Um, yes, I'm April Sims. Uh, I use she, her pronouns. Proud to serve as Secretary Treasurer of the Washington State Labor Council. Um, I also want to thank um, I want to thank everyone globally for standing in solidarity with our mass movement demanding justice. Justice for George Floyd, justice for Breonna Taylor, justice for Manuel Ellis, justice for all the names we know, and justice for many more that we don't and may never know. Uh, but beyond justice for lives taken, there is an overwhelming call to acknowledge and dismantle the racism and the inequities that are baked into our institutions into our policing, into our government and elections, into our education systems, and yes, even into our own unions. Um, I do wanna uh, start by telling you that it was my mom's union job that got our family off of welfare and her union job that gave her economic dignity for the first time in her life and her union pension that allowed her to retire with financial stability. So I know firsthand the difference that the union makes in the lives of workers, families, and communities. And it's that knowledge that's driven my service in this movement and that knowledge that drives my vision for the kind of labor movement that we can have moving forward. Um, and I share that with you because I hope that any criticism you hear from me today, um, you know is born from my deep, deep love for this movement and the knowledge of the difference that it makes uh, specifically for women and people of color and women of color in terms of ending the cycle of poverty that they may be trapped in. Um, I am the first black woman elected executive officer of the Washington State Labor Council, which means I live at the intersection of sexism and racism. I spend my time navigating systems and structures that weren't designed with me in mind the systems that have historically left women and people of color out and behind. And at the same time, we know that women and people of color are the fastest growing demographic in our movement. In the United States, women will be the majority of union members by 2025. So that's just in four short years. And the working class will be majority minority by 2035. And for workers between the ages of 24 and 35, they'll reach that milestone next year. But unfortunately, uh, this is not reflected in our membership. Fewer than 20% of our elected leaders are women. And we have a dominant culture that tells us how leadership should look, act, walk, and talk. And in some cases, if you don't match that model, then you may not look like a leader. So we have to strategize and pass policies. Um, policies similar to Convention 190 and recommend, Recommendation 206 to end gender-based violence. Um, policies like Initiative 124, which passed in Seattle, that allowed hospitality workers access to panic buttons and created a procedure for sexual assault and harassment. Uh, strategies for recruitment and retention and ways to support women in leadership. But we know that strategy eats culture for breakfast. So we have to change the culture if we really want to impact change so that women and people of color and specifically women of color can stay in positions of leadership because we know that representation matters. So it's no longer enough for us to have just a seat at the table. We have to demand that we be dealt into the game, explain the rules, and have a chance to change the rules because they know that they weren't written with us in mind. Um, and that kind of change only happens when we center the experiences of women and people of color in our solutions, uh, which really only happens when we're in positions of leadership. Now, we are currently faced with an unprecedented set of circumstances, a global pandemic that's threatening our communities, a pending recession and increased economic hardships, and a mass resurgence for the century old struggle for racial justice. And this moment requires leadership, but that won't be easy or quick. But we're not without guidance. So we can look to our ancestors and our elders in the movement. We know that labor is at its strongest when working people stand shoulder to shoulder, together across race, creed, gender, and borders. And it, that it's working people united from the streets to our workplaces 
in our homes and in the halls of power, where we have the tools at our disposal to force change. And protest is one of these tools, as we've seen in recent weeks, the power of protesting. Organizing is one of these tools. You just have to look at the farm workers in, Yam in Yakima who are organizing and demanding a voice and a union to change their working conditions. Voting is one of these tools. Uh, we have a big election this year and we have to do all of it. We have to harness the power in the streets into the halls of power and into the voting polls. So many of us, I think, are feeling angry and frustrated, maybe grief stricken and a little bit anxious in this moment. And it can be overwhelming and leave some of us feeling isolated and powerless. But I suggest that what if instead we think of our emotions as bricks and the material to be used to build a movement that demands the future that working people need and centers the needs of the most marginalized among us. And so we're working to use the tools available to us uh, to join our rage and our sadness and our anxiety with that of our siblings in the movement so that we can create a force that can't be ignored and that we can speak with a voice that won't be silenced. Thank you. Thank you so much, April. I'm sure there'll be a number of questions that we'll come back to afterwards. Um, I'd like to move now and call on our second speaker, Gail Cartmail. Um, Gail is the Assistant General Secretary of UNITE, the Union in the United Kingdom. Gail, I'd like to invite you to speak about how to promote women in the trades, um, and especially in male-dominated sectors, if you would. You're still muted, Gail. I doubt that's the first time you've said that <laughs> in this world of Zoom. Um, I was thanking you, Madeleine, uh, and also April. Um, and I just want to start, if I may, by uh, touching on some of the issues that April already touched on, which is where are we, we women, today? April has behind her a powerful po poster of uh, a powerful woman, Angela Davis. And on my wall, I have a poster that says, prepare your daughter for working life, give her less pocket money than your son. Um, and that poster is very old. And when I first started working in 1970, we passed the Equal Pay Act, and yet still we do not have equal pay. So where are we? We're underpaid, we're undervalued, we carry dual roles as workers and homemakers. Globally, social and economic structures have ingrained bias against women of all ages. Our laws and statutes are riddled with sexism or ineffective mechanisms for addressing uh, sex inequalities. We face the persistent issue of women's confinement in so-called low-skilled jobs precarious work in the informal sector, sexual violence and harassment, and insensitive uh, gender-blind occupational health and safety and welfare. And for example, in 2020, in construction, um, personal protective equipment is ill-fitting, therefore uh, introducing obviously avoidable hazard. And in almost every country, the problem of inadequate toilet and hygiene provision for women in construction and forestry unbelievably remains their priority issue. So that's centuries of exploitation and discrimination. And as has already been said, our trade union structures are not immune to practices that discount our voices and serve to preserve male privilege. Um, but history tells us any gain we've made has never been given but was fought for. And we've been reminded of this by the Black Lives Matters movement and before it the climate justice protests and the Me Too movements. And I just think it's important to say that we're not um, seeking pity, empathy, consolation or a pat on the head. We are demanding our share of power to make decisions to influence change and for seats at the bargaining table. And to achieve our post-pandemic goal of building back better, 
we women must find means by which to empower ourselves and other women to take up leadership from the forest floor to the cement factory and on construction sites and within our unions and communities. I want to say BWI, the Building and Work, uh, Woodworkers International um, I'm speaking for today, has inspirational women leaders. Our affiliate in Myanmar has a woman unionist, Sandra Poso, who is the Assistant General Secretary of the National Centre that is building unions in a really tough organising environment. King Yun Shin from South Korea is a tower crane operator and the chair of the regional BWI Women's Committee. Justina Jonas Mvula is the general secretary in Namibia of Manu, and we are proud of them. And they are, there are more, many more women. Um, I think we may have 258 women on this conference who are powerful women, who can seize control of the bargaining agenda um, if we work together. So I want to conclude by asking what should a pro-woman post-pandemic collective bargaining agenda include? Firstly, we have to mainstream equality, women's equality into every single collective agreement and that includes risk assessments. We must ask, does this agreement work for women? And if it does not work for women, why not? And what needs to change? We need to get the words right, but also the procedures to ensure implementation with monitoring that includes women in the assessment and evaluation processes of any agreement we negotiate. There is no such thing as too much equality. We should routinely ask and check our women in the meetings with industry bodies, with government. And are we shaping economic and social decisions, because if not, why not? And how can our exclusion be justified? Take, for example, the second pandemic of sexual violence against women and girls. Yes, it should be on the collective bargaining agenda, but it should also be a priority issue for governments, because to be tackled effectively, um, services to lift women out of abuse require public funding, financial and structural support. And women trade unionists around the bargaining table with government would secure that. Finally, following the global economic crisis of 2008, it was commonly spoken that the economy cannot be allowed to return to business as usual, yet that is exactly what transpired. Economic and health inequalities in reality have widened. So building back better can only be achieved with women at the center of change. We union women, we have the energy, we have the experience, we have the dedication, we have practical ideas about how to organize and educate. And to win change, we have to put women at the heart of all of our negotiations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gail. I think that the messages coming from both you and April just now, you said women to seize control of the bargaining agenda. April said that we need to change organizational culture. So when we seize control, we change organizational culture, we change the rules, and we use all of the tools at our disposal. I think we're, we're well off to a, a call to action that everybody can join in. I'd like to call on our third speaker now. Sofia Branco is president of the Union of Journalists of Portugal. Um, so Sofia, in many countries, women have been conspicuous by their absence from the news coverage of COVID-19. Can you say something about why that is, given that the majority of health workers, for one, are women, for instance, and how can we make sure that women become part of the news story, especially in public service media, and also the unions, the role that unions can play in all of that? Thank you. Good afternoon, every, everyone. Thank you for, for having me. It has been a pleasure to, to hear uh, the previous speakers. Um, my name is Sofia. I'm joining you from uh, Lisbon. I'm the president of a parity board, uh, a union parity board. Uh, I will take the chance to point out to, to the role of the media on transforming societies and promoting equality and diversity. As far as I know, there are no specific data on the presence of women in the, in the news during the pandemic crisis. Uh, if there was, I believe it would show a twofold scenario. Uh, on one hand, we had many stories on health professionals 
And as you said, the majority are women. Uh, in the case of Portugal, the huge, huge majority of, uh, of health professionals are, are women. Uh, we had their stories on, con on conciliation, uh, conciliating work with family, for example. Uh, we had also at the same time many articles on the specific and harsher impact uh, of the crisis on women. Uh, also because the International Labour Organization has been stressing that a lot. So we had articles on employment, teleworking, anxiety, conciliation, uh, all with, uh, with uh, a gender impact. Um, on the other hand, uh, and as usual, um, we have more uh, men speaking in the front line because they, ha they are hospital directors, they are the scientists, we, we hear the epidemiologists, the political and economic leaders. Uh, we had more men experts, even on a topic like health. Uh, in the case of Portugal, and I think it's interesting, uh, the management of the crisis has been done by two women. We have a minister of health, uh, she's a woman, uh, we have a director, a general director for health, and she is a woman too. And even so, we had TV debate shows uh, with a majority of men's, men uh, as uh, speaking about uh, the crisis. What is, uh, well, this is a little bit paradoxical, uh, this case of coronavirus, um, but uh, it's, it has been like this. And I would like to point out to a, a massive study that is conducted every five years. It is called Who Makes the News? Uh, and it's conducted by uh, the Global Media Monitoring Project. Um, every five years, and we will have a new one in 2020 now, this year. Um, in 2015, we had 114 countries participating. And it's one day, everyone looks at the news, uh, TV, uh, press, uh, radio, and also online. In 2015, we already had uh, Twitter, for example. And this study um, has basically uh, says that the slow, the progress is very, very slow. It has been done since 2000 and nothing has really, really changed. So we still have uh, uh, women represent 24% of the persons that we hear about, read about, see, about, see uh, in newspaper, television and radio, 10, 24%, they are subject of news. Um, this number was the same in 2010, so if we compare, nothing has really changed. Uh, it decreases to 16% if we are, we are talking about uh, uh, articles on political or economic uh, topics. Uh, and only one out of five experts are, are women. Uh, and this is, uh, of course, something we have to uh, discuss, uh, we as journalists, because we have a role on changing this. But also media is a very, very conservative and traditional uh, media, <laughs> saying the, the, repeating myself, uh, as the society. So media represents societies. If the society is, is conservative, media will be conservative too. So this is very difficult. Uh, so it is true that journalism in general, globally, represents a male-centric view, uh, which is, uh, and sometimes even gender biased or even stereotyped. Uh, because if we look at some, uh, uh, another interesting number is uh, the news reporting on gender equality uh, in all the, when this study uh, was done, were 9%. nine uh, it, it were, they were even less, they were 4%, the, the articles that actually challenged gender stereotypes. Because we can talk about things and not really challenge them. Uh, and this is something else. So it's, it's, uh, uh, we have to think uh, about uh, all this as, uh, as uh, we have a glass ceiling problem also in the news. So we have now a context where, mm, for example, in Portugal, women account for 48% of journalists. So we have parity basically, but we have three uh, female directors out of 20. So of course we have a glass ceiling in management and leadership positions. What can we do? Because I think we have to uh, uh, make action, uh, you know, act to change. We need to train women, uh, including women journalists, so that they don't underestimate themselves and their capacities. This is media training even. We have to do media training for women to feel safe and empowered when they talk to media because it's not easy. Uh, I've been doing this for 20 years now, and it's not easy to convince women on distinguished positions uh, or with high careers to be sources. Uh, we will take more time convincing them and they will need more time to prepare. Uh, so one helpful tool could be, for example, a, a database 
uh, with women experts in every field that could be distributed in newsrooms, and this is something the unions can promote. This has been done, for example, in Denmark, as far as, far as I know. We also need to demand more of the public services, the public media in the case. They have a special duty to promote uh, gender equality and assure diversity. And so we as citizens, and the unions included, of course, we have to demand more. We have to complain when we see TV debates that have six men uh, talking about uh, any kind of topic, because it's, it's unjustifiable that any kind of topic uh, is discussed only by men or with a majority of men at, at this point. Women journalists have also to reflect uh, on the reasons uh, why do we always choose men to talk to? Um, are we practicing self-censorship? Are we openly ignoring women's issues because they might block our professional goals? Uh, this is a discussion, an internal discussion we have to have. And unions have to give the example too. We have to put up with parity boards. Uh, we have to involve younger women on, on, on the union. And we have to promote a gender focus, for example, in the, in the studies we participate, in the university research, uh, researchers, everything like that. And, uh, uh, and uh, we have to, to join every effort like we are doing here uh, that basically points out that uh, this is a question, it's a very important one. And uh, the media, of course, have a very, very important role to play. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sophia. So we do need to make complaints about uh, what have been referred to as manalists, which we surprisingly continue to see across sectors, across the world, all the time. Sometimes you could have a panel of all men discussing gender equality issues. It's not unusual to see that. So um, there's still a way to go and some work to do. Thank you. Um, I'll call now on our fourth speaker, Jyoti Makwan, who is the General Secretary of the Self-Employed Women's Association in India. Um, Jyoti Sewa organizes women workers in the informal economy in India, where more than 60% of women workers work uh, in, in your country. Could you share with us the key elements that women in the informal sector need to have to sustain a livelihood? Thank you. Mm. Thank you so much and hello to everyone. Um, yeah, of course, you meant that we are a women's union organizing the women workers in the informal economy of our country. And we have organized 2 million women workers in our country up till now. And it's almost 50 years of our union to be in existence. And of course, we'll go more 50 years with this women uh, strength, the Seva movement will go ahead. And uh, I would like to, uh, which is very close to us now in our union with our members, because um, we together with our members have thought on what will be our new normal life. So we do have some thoughts on it and I would be very happy to share on it because it was a time where we reflect ourselves on our futures. And when we say on whatever points we say, because we are very much linked with the lives of our members. And when it comes to the union life, so the life of our members and the union lives are very close. They are both together. So together with our members, we have thought on some of the guidelines and some of the points on what will be our new normal life look like. And uh, more of that, uh, more of on that, that point, um, we really would like to focus on, um, sorry, um, focus on to support more local businesses and local production. So if in the villages, if, if a small women farmer is growing spices or food grains, why do I have to go outside to buy that? Why can't we make a chain within to promote the local economy? So that would also create employment because we at Seva already have created a company of these women farmers where all small producers of food grains and spices have come together. They, they collect all the food grains and spices under this company, they pack it and then they again market it to our women union members only. So I think that is also creating an employment of our, our members. And we see that this is a very sustainable way of more creating a local uh, economy and also um, to ensure that why the, the, the farmers who are growing, why they remain hungry. 
they grow food though they remain hungry which is not tolerated it could not be tolerated so that is one thing we would like to promote on so individually all members would like to go on that that we buy support local businesses and local production but also the union as a whole will go for that so that is one second and second is on how do we limit our travel because i think the travel is consuming it taking away all the oxygen what it is there so we wanted to plan our travel if there is a long travel of course we'll fly but if there are not that long travel can we use bicycles or can we walk so we really would like to work on because the carbon footprints we talk on the climate but then this this are the ways because we saw in the lockdown the air was so clean there was no vehicle on the roads and the air was clean so can that be a base for our planning for the future so each individual members and the seva as a whole our union as a whole would like to plan on can we limit our travel or no and thirdly it is uh, more on um, how do we um, more do an energy audit in our home too because uh, what are we using we have to see uh, in terms of what how much water we are using how much electricity we are using both in our union offices and all in our member houses so we would like to plan on that because that seems to be very important are we still wanted to go more for solar if we wanted to reduce the use of electricity so what are the options on if we uh wanted to cut down the usage of of the energy in terms of um more doing an audit in our home and audit in our union too so we would like to take that to be a third step on going ahead maybe we can uh, grow more foods in our home if we have a small land we can uh, use the wastage of water in in growing vegetables in our small backyards or the herbal medicine which we could use and also harvest the rain water so how do we plan for individually harvesting the rain water and uh, find ways to cut down our energy and water usage so that that would be third guideline on what we would like to do the fourth is more on clean better we have to clean our body we have to clean our home we have to clean our bathroom we have to clean our roads clean our theaters clean our offices but can we plan that we can use whatever cleaning material we are using on our body in our home in our offices can we reduce using the less chemicals in cleaning this because while while you use more chemical of course you you clean fast but then is that the way do can we cut down of uses of more chemicals in cleaning our home our body and our city so that would be four and fifth would be more on disposable of waste but that we have to do very responsibly because if how do we create much less waste in our home in our offices and if we are at all we have we are creating waste can we reuse those waste can we recycle those waste in our home or in our offices so we would really like to go maybe i'm speaking on a very local base but this is what we wanted to plan as a union in our individual life and also in the life of our union jyoti thank you so much i think this is a very powerful example of how um strategies and ideas for change are rooted in women's lived realities and i i very much appreciate the way that you said that the union's demands are crafted on the basis of what the union's members are actually experiencing in their individual lives we know that change is incremental right and depends on each one of us taking action so what you've described actually is a model for individuals but also for the organization that represents those individuals so I, i think it's definitely something we can all look forward to taking forward thank you so much thank i you. will call now you're welcome i'll call now on our fifth speaker maria rön is vice president of lada for benet in sweden the swedish cheaters union um maria globally with some regional differences of course the teaching profession is dominated by women in your country sweden it's as high as 75% 
Um, could you say something about the union's work to improve salary rates, um, ensure that uh, teaching professionals have professional uh, development and autonomy rights, and how these actually go to address the structural inequalities that women face in teaching, but also in other women, female-dominated professions? Yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Maria Rön. As you said, I'm the vice president of Lara Förbundet uh, in Sweden, the Swedish Teachers Union, and member organization of Education International. I'm very grateful to be part of this webinar of this important issue, making gender equality the new normal. Sweden and my country, as some of you might know it, ranks quite high in gender equality. Uh, this, of course, makes us proud, but still humble because we are well aware that more work needs to be done. As many, as many countries, we also struggle with gender-based segregation of the labor market. Uh, and that uh, explains most of the gap between men's and women's salary in Sweden. The teaching profession is one example of gender-based segregation of labor. In Sweden, as Madeleine mentioned, 75% of teachers are women. These women are high, highly skilled professionals. But when we compare to similar complex jobs, teaching is a profession with less autonomy, lower salaries, and a lack of career opportunities. And that is gender inequality at a structural level. As a teacher union, we of course need to contract these injustices. But our focus as teacher union is not that we organize a female dominated sector. Our efforts lie instead in creating the preconditions for a more autonomous teaching profession with higher salaries and better career opportunities. By lifting the whole profession, we believe we will counteract the structural inequalities that exists in our labor market. Sufficient economic resources need to be made available across the whole public sector. And as a teachers union, we focus on an education system which needs to be ad adequately staffed where educators' rights are respected and where salaries don't fall behind making teachers leave the profession. We want to ensure that teaching is an attractive profession with possibilities for every teacher to develop. When negotiating teachers' salaries, we demand that the complexity of teaching should be recognized and teachers paid in accordance with the complexity and in accordance with the responsibility uh, which follows in supporting new generations. Because teachers, as you know, make a big difference in the long term in developing knowledge, skills, democratic citizenship, including values such as gender equality. We used to say it all starts with good teachers together keeping in mind that some students in our schools today will not retire until the end of this century. So what we do as teachers and the values that we teach will matter for a long time. And for this, the whole teaching profession needs to be valued. But still, our profession is less paid than other male-dominated professions, so more work needs to be done. Also, studies have found that professions dominated by women tend to be less listened to by their employers, particularly when the workload increases and there is a need for more resources. As a teachers union, we often witness this. Women's competence need to be valued and women's right to continuous professional development also needs to be ensured. Teaching needs to be a career which provides opportunities for continuous professional development, as well as a sector where female leadership is supported and formed. Uh, in order to make this happen, we are currently using the social dialogue to develop a transparent national professional development program 
for all teachers and school leaders. And we are hopeful that this will make a change towards more equality in the labor market. So by making efforts to change the preconditions for the whole profession, we contribute in creating a more equal labor market, hopefully making gender equality the new normal. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria. I, I liked your emphasis there on the need to raise the status of the profession, where we see them being lowered in female-dominated professions such as teaching. Um, I'll call now to our six uh, panelists. Rose Omamo, who's the General Secretary of the Amalgamated Union of Kenyan Metal Workers. Rose, what can trade unions, especially in male-dominated sectors, contribute to making the new normal gender equal? Thank you, uh, Madeline, for uh, giving me this opportunity. I'm so happy to participate in this webinar today uh, that we are discussing gender equal uh, new normal. Uh, my name is Rose Omamo, uh, the General Secretary of Amalgamated Union of Kenya Metal Workers, of course, a male dominated union that has 90% male and 10% female. And to build a gender equal new normal, we need strong trade unions that should fight to ensure that gender equality becomes a reality in the world of work. And for this, we need trade unions in male dominated sectors, such as energy, engineering, and manufacturing. Uh, they must have gender targeted programs to build a more responsive gender equitable workplace, taking into account the vulnerable states of women and the disproportionate effect that COVID-19 has had on women. We need trade unions that would fight for equality, calling for concrete and genuine actions for gender equality and social progress, and actions to fight the stereotypes and social norms, as has been named, that perpetuate discrimination and domination against women. In male-dominated uh, sectors, we need trade unions that have inclusive structures reflecting diversity, not only in terms of gender, but also in terms of color, age, identity, and sexual orientation. You know, women must feel represented and protected by their unions. Diverse and more inclusive and respectful decision-making bodies and leadership will allow women to better identify with their unions and feel uh, reflected in those unions. It is why it is essential to get more women leaders within the male-dominated unions. Uh, you know, some of the obstacles that women in uh, leadership have is that they do not have role models in male-dominated unions. And it becomes very difficult for uh, the women to identify with organizations with an aging leadership of men where they cannot discuss their issues freely. And uh, so women leaders need to be made more visible in those male-dominated uh, unions in order to attract more workers uh, to uh, become members of the union and to be very active even in, uh, you know, social media where they can uh, freely air their views. Um, in these male-dominated trade unions, uh, we need to see us coming up with guidelines and mechanisms on how victims of violence, abuse, or sexual harassment can report to the authorities and how they will keep themselves safe and cope with the effects of COVID-19. Because this is a challenge that women are facing when they get to their places of work, they find that the environment is not conducive. So when they are abused sexually, they are not able to get authorities that would stand with them in, in airing out their views. So uh, female trade unionists, we also add to often report their uh, difficulty in convincing their male colleagues during collective bargaining negotiations to keep demands related to advancement of women rights at equality on the negotiation table. I say because, because I say this because since the months of maternity protection, parental leave, flexible hours and work balance, violence and harassment, adoption of uh, workplace equipment, 
are some of the, 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 the demands that are often dropped during negotiations. And so you find that um, when the collective bargaining negotiation team is seated, the demands for women are, are dropped. And this must become priorities and included in collective bargaining agreements. So women must really, you know, come up and report such difficulties. Uh, you find that in male-dominated sectors like base metal, for example, or in the mining or in the auto sector, there is a very slow, uh, a very low penetration of women in uh, traditional masculine. You find that uh, finding women machinery operators, finding women in maintenance or technical in trade is not uh, very much in the male-dominated uh, you know, industries. So women are mainly concentrated in administration and support work as well as in finance, uh, some of them in human resource and in legal. So many of the women workers represent a wide part of the precarious work in the janitorial and catering in these industries. So the women are concentrated in lowly paying occupations, as was said by our former speakers, and this contributes to an industry-wide gender pay gap. You know, unions need to fight against the industry and job segregation. We need to attract more women in male-dominated technical and technological sectors. And we need to ensure that women in these sectors are not, con uh, are not concentrated in low paid work because that is where they are today. Um, I also want to say that um, for us to build a gender equal new normal, we also need to change mindsets. Mindsets must be challenged, particularly those on male trade unions. Men are majorly the majority of members and leaders in our organizations, the organization like the metal workers where I come from. So their commitments is essential to these transformations to be effective. They must be there for the women. They must work with the women. They must make sure that the women's demands are put on negotiation tables and men must be made aware of the conscious and the unconscious discrimination that women face in unions, as well as the causes of this discrimination. Because sometimes they pretend not to understand. We know they do, but they pretend not to understand. So we must make them aware of, of, of such. And as well as in social and cultural norms, we need to really make sure that we push them to also join in the fight. So I want to say that the fight for equality is not an issue to be dealt with by women alone. We need men. We need trade unions. That must be a priority for trade unions during this COVID-19 period. Our issues must be men's priority. They must be trade union priorities, not just be fought by, by women. And I want to finally say in my conclusion that male-dominated trade union should ensure that the female gender perspective it's not forgotten when it comes to making decisions that affect women uh, in their respective unions within their new normal. I think that would be very necessary so that we can also involve policymakers to make sure that um, female gender perspective is not forgotten at all. Because once it is forgotten during this period, then we are left out and we will continue to suffer because we are the most affected. So that's what I can share about what is needed uh, to, to, for the trade unions in the male-dominated uh, sector to contribute to building a gender equal new normal. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rose. Um, you mentioned the issue of women's leadership a number of times, and I'd like to jump on that right away because th those are some of the questions that I've seen coming through in the Q&A. Um, so I'm going to uh, perhaps put our, our earlier speakers a little bit on the spot because all of you have touched on the need for women to be in leadership positions, right? And the difference that that can make. It's important, I think Ro Rose mentioned in her comments, the issue of role models. So it's important for any young women out of the 275 listening to you now to know 
what were the building blocks for you? What has sustained you? What did you find useful? How did you get to be where you are? And how do you remain where you are? What advice would you give to younger women? Because also based on a lot of what you said, the issue of youth and young women in, in leadership position is critical. Um, in the question that was posed, that the person asking the question said, our unions are not going to look like they're responsive to the experiences of their members if the leadership looks nothing like them and doesn't take up their issues. So I'm going to come to you first, April, and ask you about your own experience of being a woman leader. Oh, thank you. I, I love this question. Um, you know, I often tell folks that I'm here because someone saw leadership in me long before I saw it in myself. Um, I'm here because someone invited me to a union meeting and that's how I got involved. So I think, um, you know, in terms of strategies and uh, ways to shift culture, I have, so my, let me back up. My journey um, is because someone believed in me and um, kept pushing me because the shop steward in my work site was trained in leadership identification and leadership development. So I think we have to train our leaders in how to identify folks with leadership skills and recognize that for women and people of color and for young people, um, their leadership style is gonna be much different from the traditional models that we have that's really based on um, you know, white cisgendered males. Um, so I think leadership identification and leadership development is really important. Um, in terms of how I sustain myself now, I have a cohort of women of color labor leaders that I meet with regularly that sustain me. We bounce ideas off each other. We share our experiences. We speak the same language. When we get together, there's something unique and special that happens when women support other women. Um, we can be authentic with each other in those spaces. We don't have to explain our truths because we all understand them. So, um, you know, I think finding a cohort of women um, who share your same experience is also really important. And I'll create some space for the rest of the panelists. I know I talked for quite a while on that. That's fine. Thanks a lot, April. Gail. Thank you very much. And again, following on from April, um, I read uh, as a young woman um, a book called Women, Race and Class, which was uh, written by Angela Davis. And I remember reading in that um, in order to build a sustainable movement for change, we all have the responsibility to lift others as we rise. And I have, first of all, had the courage to take up uh, positions in the trade union movement, uh, to put myself forward, uh, to have the confidence to do that because of the support of other women and the examples of women that have gone before me who did wonderful things, created workplace nurseries or led industrial trade unions, but who always had time uh, to, uh, to, to talk, to explain, um, and to encourage and also to feed back. And so my, my belief is that if everybody on this conference found a way of lifting up others as they rose in whatever task they undertake within their trade union, um, then we would swell the ranks um, of our movement with even more women. And I think back to doing some work in a part of my union, which was post office managers. And the entire union uh, leadership of that section was male. They met in a squalid hotel and uh, had terrible practices and culture. But one of the women that we identified by creating space is now elected as a member of our parliament here in the UK. And so great things are possible. Um, and, you know, in our lifetime, I think we can see great change. And of course, there are some men who are willing um, to step aside. And if they step aside, um, that is a great, uh, uh, a great thing that they can do to support and assist. We're not asking for no favors, but we're asking for our, for our rightful place. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gail. Sophia? 
Can you can you repeat the question? Yes, it was uh, in terms of women's leadership, and there's been some add something added on actually as we've been um, hearing from the other speakers. Um, your your experience, or what would you say to young women who are coming up in the union movement, and what do, what do they need to have in place to to kind of go down that road? And also, if other speakers could think about this a little bit as well, what do we need to do differently now in a post-COVID world to organize women? Mm -hmm. Uh, we, well, the unions have, uh, uh, have been having uh, difficulties on involving younger, younger people. Uh, uh, I think most, uh, most of the unions, in, in our case, definitely. And so we have been thinking about uh, other ways of involving younger people uh, among which uh, women. Uh, and we have managed because uh, sometimes they don't really want to take part on, on the board, on the work uh, more bureaucratic and more traditional way, but they do uh, participate if we do working groups, uh, for example, uh, with topics that uh, interest uh, them. Gender equality is one of them. And we have been trying to, to organize this uh, working group just on, uh, on that topic. We haven't managed because uh, we always have a crisis. Either it's a labor crisis, an employment crisis, a COVID crisis, and it's, it, we are being interrupted every time so, uh, to do that. But it's something we, we wanted to do. They are, um, the younger people do, do get involved, but they get involved differently. So I think we also need to think, uh, you know, another, uh, other ways of participating. We have, uh, in our uh, associates, we have the same number of men and women, so it's not, uh, they, are, they are there. Of course, they have all the problems uh, related with uh, conciliation, uh, uh, and it's, it's harder when, when you have, for example, meetings at night, it's harder for them to, to participate if they have kids, for example. Um, and so this is something also, uh, the work of the union has to change also, uh, uh, to be, you know, to adapt. To, to women's lives also. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, Jyoti, are you still with us? Yes. Uh, do, does your union manage to get younger women involved, um, especially in the leadership uh, roles? Very much, because uh, uh, since last, uh, I think, four or five years, we, while we see the uh, membership profile, we see a lot of our young daughters and daughter-in-laws of our members are joining our union and then it was a real challenge to us to have a meeting with only those young women uh, the youth on trying to know what are their needs and aspirations so how then our union strategize in terms of answering or taking their needs and aspirations uh, in planning our future. And uh, I think uh, we had a good exercise because we also have existing members who are older, new members are joining us, who are daughter or maybe daughter-in-law of our uh, existing members. But then in a good exercise, the existing members who are older said that we'll keep one new members with us while we go in the process of doing organizing. So they can be with us. So we will make them to learn values of our union. And the new member, the youth member said that while we go with the older one, we will help them with the technology. Great. So concrete That's how mentoring. By the older and the younger together to take the union forward. So we are working yeah. on that. Thank you. Uh, over to you, Maria. Yes, I agree, of course, with what the other panelists have said, but I think also it's very important to look at the structures within the union to, to see, too, that it's possible and it's, uh, that it's not uh, strange to be active unionist and uh, mother of small children, perhaps, and make that, uh, to make it able to combine that. I think also the mentoring that Yoti spoke about, if we can manage to make mentoring, but the other way around, that the young people mentors the experienced ones, so that we can build our policies from the ideas of those who are not been in leadership for a long time and learned the lingo and all that. I think there is a lot of interesting ideas within younger members and younger female members in particular. Um, to be heard. 
and of course uh, as a teacher i must say uh, that that the role model uh, part of it of course is very important to to encourage young women to stay true to their uh, beliefs to raise their voice and to support each other uh, that i think that's uh, key issues thank you thank you very much maria um rose did you want to say anything about also maybe a little bit about um in the post covid uh, world, this new normal, how do we go about organizing women in your, you know, still very heavily male-dominated sector? इस ऐसे क्षेत्र में जहाँ पे पुरुषों बहुत ज़्यादा हैं, उसमें आप कैसे महिलाओं को संगठित करना चाहेंगे? Also say that for us to make sure that our young people participate in in the union activities, 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 हमें उनके साथ काम करना पड़ेगा और अगर हम इकट्ठा इकट्ठे होकर काम करें तो हम आगे बढ़ सकते हैं कैसे हम उनको संगठित करें कैसे हम उनको ऑर्गेनाइज करें महिलाओं को ये बहुत जरूरी है इसके बारे में सोचना हम ये सोच रहे हैं कि ऑनलाइन तरीके से लोगों को संगठित करें उनसे संपर्क करें ताकि हम ऑनलाइन में चैट्स को का इस्तेमाल करके महिलाओं को कठा करें खास कर जो वह महिलाएं हैं उनसे हम संपर्क करें और अगर हम उनके साथ काम करें ऑनलाइन तरीके से खास कर अभी इस संकट के समय इस महामारी के समय तो हम उन तक पहुंच सकते हैं तो इसलिए मैं दोबारा कहना चाहती हूं कि ऑनलाइन तरीके से बिल्ला चाहेंगे उनको संगठित करेंगे और हमें लगता है कि ये भविष्य में हम इसको ज्यादा इसका इस्तेमाल करेंगे और ऐसे ही हम अपना आवाज उठा पाएंगे और खास कर उन मुद्दों में जो हमारे लिए मैं तो थैंक यू थैंक यू वेरी मच um, I mentioned at the beginning that we'll have three voices coming from the floor, so I want to turn to those now. Um, and I will start with the... I've got my papers on. Pardon me. First of all, Adriana Paz, who's the Latin Adriana America Regional Paz, Coordinator for the International Domestic uh, Work of Federation. Uh, and that's a uh, key uh, federation to speak to today uh, because uh, tomorrow uh, we will celebrate uh, International uh, Domestic uh, Workers Day. So, so Adriana, uh, over to you. Uh, wo unki, uh, uh, जो संगठन है उनकी प्रतिनिधि हैं और कल तो वो घरेलू कामगारों का दिवस है तो इससे ये बहुत महत्वपूर्ण और मैं मैं अब स्पेनिश में बात करूंगी y creo que está de más decir que el sector del trabajo doméstico ha sido अंग्रेजी में सुनाई नहीं दे रहा हम शामा करें अभी आवाज अंग्रेजी में नहीं आ रही हम इसलिए अनुवाद नहीं कर पा रहे कोलंबिया ब्राजील ला मेजर पार्ट दे इस मुखेरे सुन मुखेरे नेग्रस इन लोस पाइसेस अंदिनोस ला मेजर पार्ट 98 परसेंट 96 सुन मुखेरे इंडिजेनस इस देसीर के ला मेजर पार्ट दे लास मुखेरे के रियलिसन एल ट्रावाहो दे लोगार सुन मुखेरे मिग्रेंटेस नेग्रस इंडिजेनस इ इन सु मेजरिया पोब्रेस Aquí encontramos una eh, múltiple intersección de sistemas de opresión que hacen eh, que estas... Aquí podemos encontrar una de las intersecciones. Durante la crisis, las mujeres fueron las mujeres más peores porque estaban ya trabajando en las peores condiciones. No tenían una solución económica, dado que eran los más peores pagados. Y para responder a Madeleine's pregunta, in this new normality, mm -hmm. what can we do? Can we How can we face this kind of inequalities. gender inequalities that we're seeing mostly in, in all the domestic work? 
Well, for us in our movement, well, for us it's been one of the most important things we had to do was to question this colonial mentality where, where they understand that domestic work is not work. And this has started ago, probably 20, 30 years ago in Latin America. Domestic workers are starting, started fighting. These workers were not, were not considered members of the family and we needed to ensure that they were covered by the legislation, they did, were worthy of respect and dignity. Uh, convention 189 is that of decent work for domestic workers. Convention 190, of course, is the convention to violence in the world of work. So we need to change these colonial mentalities of a patriarchal culture and of this neoliberal economy, which places the burden of this work on women. The state should be responsible for care policies here. We also need to change the legislation which is unfair. Now, during the pandemic, we have approached individual members, we have brought them food because they're not only poor, they're actually going hungry. And in this work of solidarity and of sharing experiences, we've actually managed to increase membership the only way to challenge the situation is to organize at the grassroots. I'll stop here. I'd remind you that tomorrow is the Domestic Workers Day. We'll be holding a webinar together with the ILO. We would like to remind you, particularly our male comment here, that this work, domestic work, is equal in value to other work. None of us could be here if we don't have other people helping us, and it needs to be valued. So this new normal needs to recognize this perspective where the work of women and caring for the home is center stage of economic and political and social policies for our governments. Thank you very much, Madeline, and everyone else. Thank you very much, Adriana. And I'd like to apologize. We had some technical issues with the uh, translations there. I think the technical team have been trying to try and figure that out. Um, and I'll say a, great, a quick thank you and a goodbye to Kel Cartmel, who has to leave us shortly. Thank you so much for your contributions, and we look forward to continuing the conversation with you moving forward. Um, so our next uh, speaker from the floor is uh, Shweta Tripathi from Hind Mahila Sabha Indian Women's Association, who will speak to us about the centrality of public services for gender equal new normal. Over to you, Shweta. Thank you. Thank you, Madeline. It's nice here to be the part of this webinar where all the women heat could be seen and uh, feel motivated as well. I'm speaking on behalf of PSI, Public Services International, as a affiliated union Indian Women Association. Um, before starting, actually, I think it's important to notify that in today's world scenario, it will be challenging to achieve gender equality without quality public services. It is very much required to create gender responsiveness, quality public services, especially around essential services like health, care, water, electricity, sanitation, and of course, education, because the lack of such apps women, girls, and especially youth are the most impacted when countries over offer poor facilities, especially in developed countries. Gender responsiveness cannot be ensured without proper addressing and formulation the neutral structures, historical and non-patriarchal discrimination rules and policies at the workplace and in the union that can transform human life, especially women and youth. The main barrier hindering gender responsiveness of public services is to confront fiscal disfit by embracing austerity measures that actually not giving any hope to the citizens and provoking the situation of crisis. The tax avoidance is another major, major, major issue actually because of which corporates do not pay their fair taxes and therefore there is less money to invest in the public services 
sustainable infrastructure and social protection that are the three drivers of the gender equality whenever privatization hold their hands on basic public services and infrastructures it will always result in deterioration in quality especially for the most vulnerable demanding budget cuts which is which is in practice has a direct impact on the public services it not only the bedrock of the populism or social unrest it is also a frontal attack on the women rights because women tends to be the most dependent on public social services which have the capacity to shift the unpaid care burden that falls disappropriately on their shoulders like cleaning cooking looking after depending family members are still women affairs and across south asia if we'll see women reports doing more unpaid care and domestic works than men 10 times as much in pakistan seven times more in india and three times more in nepal and bangladesh this was this proportionate situation means that in this 21st century also women have a few opportunities for education training and work making their economic empowerment very difficult even when women manage to work they are often trapped in low paid poor quality jobs sexual harassment physical threats non recognized as a workers many of them social labor protection and the decent worker conditions with consequence for current and the future income sensitivity this scenario of discrimination could be understand in more matter manner in current public health system when the current covid-19 pandemic situation if we see today also the backbone of the public health system that is community health workers and child care workers are seen as volunteer workers in all over south asia and are devoid of any workers rights such as minimum wage no employment benefits like maternity leave paid leave social security etc all these are denied as they are volunteers not workers and it's really unfortunate to see that when world is fighting with this pandemic situation of covid-19 these workers are putting and working day and night by putting their lives in risk for the society and the welfare of the world but they themselves have no right to work no workers right we need to understand and start acting to the fact that private sector profits on public services is not ethical and if we are thinking that public services are the way in which human rights are materialized especially women human rights we need to put health over wealth and we need to put care over profits it is also important to protect value and recognize health care workers who are majority group of women as fundamental public sector workers so in the conclusion point on behalf of psi i actually would like to urge with all of us that it is important now to renew our commitment especially the mindsets toward the gender equality and the human rights through our negotiation intervention at the state level with the government and that should also come with a clear gender responsiveness at the ground of recruitment policy formulation with clear equity recommendations and its implementation implementation strategies to strengthen the quality public services for all with open mindset of inclusiveness along with also required empowering women towards their right and encouraging encouraging them at the leadership position not only at the workplace but also in the trade union movement in this new normal life as a woman will going to struggle more to remain in the labor market and secure social social protection entitlement through employment if we as a unionist social representative will not act with full force dedication and commitment toward women human rights universal right based quality public services are a feminist issue surely our solidarity action with will secure this women right in the quality public services in the new era of normal life thank you so much thank you so much shweta um and we'll turn to our third and final intervention from the floor from susan murray who's an occupational health and safety expert who's recently been working with some of the global unions on women and occupational health and safety over to you susan thank you very much can you hear me uh, yes okay Thank you for inviting me to talk to you today and, and um, greetings to everybody. Um, I'm talking about making women visible in occupational health and safety. 
women face multiple issues, as we have heard, combining risks to their health and safety and discrimination and precarious work. And these are not visible for many reasons, including the lack of occupational health and safety research on women. Applying occupational health and safety or medical research, which has been done on men to women, or not adapting workplaces such as sanitary facilities for women, puts people at risk, puts women at risk. It may also be a barrier to employment in male dominated workplaces such as transport, mining, construction and more, reinforcing existing occupational gender segregation. As we know, women workers are in the front line in the current health crisis, in, uh, working in health and social care, agriculture, retail and transport and others, at the same time carrying the bulk of caring and domestic work at home and thus creating a double jeopardy to their health. A recent TUC UK survey found that a quarter of pregnant women have faced discrimination at work during this crisis, including being forced to leave their job because the employer was unable to make their workplace safe. And one size does not fit all. PPE, of which we have heard a lot recently, is generally designed by men for men, but it doesn't fit. If it doesn't fit, it won't re re protect workers. A health worker quoted recently in the British press said, PPE is designed for a six foot three inch bloke built like a rugby player. But women's action is visible in the current crisis, as we know. The UN Human Rights Commissioner Group on Discrimination Against Women and Girls said recently, despite the disproportionate negative effects of the crisis on women, as well as their presence in frontline roles and their critical role, in keeping communities running, they are largely absent from local, national and global COVID-19 response teams, policy spaces and decision making. However, as we know, and I'm, this is my words, in a few countries, women are leading national responses that have recorded better outcomes and progress in curbing the virus. So it's our lives, women's lives, Unionised workplaces are known to be fairer, more equal and safer. Taking action for women's equality in the new normal means, I suggest, a gender responsive approach to occupational health and safety is essential for trade unions, workplaces, governments and international financial bodies. So taking action in the workplace. Employers, as we know, must ensure safe and healthy workplaces consult with workers. Joint health and safety committees and trade union safety representatives, women and men must be fully involved and women must be supported to participate by their employer and by their trade union. And I, some, one of the earlier speakers mentioned, for example, the timing of meetings is crucial to fit in with other responsibilities. So some ideas to campaign for governments to take gender responsive action by in consultation with trade unions at all times, improving data collection, furthering scientific research on the gender dimensions of occupational safety and health and public health to make women's and men's needs and realities visible, visible and serve as a basis for gender responsive health and safety policies and their implementation. Ensuring that women workers are visible and represented on health and safety and public health advisory bodies and their views are taken into account and actioned. Ensuring that occupational health and safety legislation is developed and monitored in consultation with trade unions to ensure that it is relevant to all workers. And training and supporting labour inspectorates in gender responsive enforcement of occupational health and safety law and of course, ratifying conventions 189 and 190. Uh, together, we can create a new normal where women are visible in occupational health and safety. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susan. Uh, a question that we have another eight minutes left, but I'd like to give uh, each of the panelists uh, 
a minute and a half to respond to a question that emerged just now in the Q and A. Um, I think it was April's uh, presentation right at the beginning that kind of implied that if unions are going to make a difference to the new normal to ensure it's gender equal, then they must model that. And this question is around the issue of sexual harassment, which is out there, but it's also in here, in our own union houses. So how do we make sure that unions model a har harassment-free, violence-free organization in the new normal? Um, I'm actually gonna come to you first, Maria, because I know that a lot of did a lot of work on this issue uh, in light of the uh, Me Too, hashtag Me Too uh, movement that kicked off in 2017? Okay, well, thank you. Uh, I think the most important of all is to start to talk about it. Because when we talk about it, we, we see what is going on. And if, we, if there is something to learn from the COVID-19 crisis, is that we can see how important uh, the trade union work and the, the health and safety officers works on the local level is uh, and if we can create the, sa the same uh, sense of urgency and the same concern uh, about the gender equality uh, issues and about uh, gender-based violence issues I'm sure that the that um, experience that we have now uh, from the crisis, from uh, daily risk assessments, uh, from risk management and all that, that we do on a daily basis now in the crisis, if we can create the same sense of urgency for women's rights for, uh, uh, against gender-based violence, if we can create that uh, sense of, of uh, urgency and use the tools that we now, with, with regained um, uh, self-confidence in the union, if we combine that, I think that can lead us to a new normal where, where uh, equality is, is, is the normal, yes. Thank you, thank you so much. April? Oh, I love this question because it gets right to uh, what are the solutions, right? Um, and what is the work that we can do? So I want to, you know, piggyback on what Maria said around it starts with creating space to have the conversation um, and challenging what are uh, the norms in some of our institutions. The AFL-CIO has uh, a code of conduct that they passed that uh, governs all of our meeting spaces, um, whether we're meeting virtually or in person, just setting the expectation and the standard for behavior in terms of how we're going to engage and the space that we're trying to create so that everyone can fully participate. The Washington State Labor Council at the local level has passed a number of resolutions um, calling on us to do the work around both gender equity and the work to end gender-based violence that includes workshops and training, um, as well as identifying best practices in collective bargaining agreements and language that we can insert into those collective bargaining agreements uh, to address gender-based violence. Um, I also think, you know, those policies and those strategies are good, but it all comes down to the culture and the more women you have in leadership, um, the more focus there is on that behavior and the more focus there is on the solutions. Um, and that's really why representation matters so much because we can bring our full authentic selves and our experience into our spaces um, and lead with authenticity. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, Rose, uh, on the issue of um, sexual harassment and making sure that our unions are, are free of that and free of other forms of gender-based violence. I, I, thank you. I, I think the most important thing here is uh, to have a proper grievance handling and dispute handling process and procedures that would also uh, put into consideration the issues of reporting and, mon and investigations because uh, this is uh, what is really um, affecting women because they don't have proper procedures to report and even proper procedures for, you know, trying to investigate these uh, sexual harassment cases and coming up with uh, uh, good results that would favor uh, the, the women that have been, you know, sexually harassed. So I think um, as trade unions, we need to really look into that. But above all, I think if Convention 190 is ratified, and the contents therein domesticated and put in the party's collective bargaining agreements. 
that would be a lasting solution for uh, trade unions to, you know, have a model of harassment-free models in the workplaces. I think that is very important for me. Thank you, thank you very much, Rose. Sophia, may I, maybe I could turn to you and, you know, we know that sometimes the role that the media plays in reporting about sexual harassment and the, the efforts that are made to reduce it is not quite where we would like it to be. So what, what changes do you see that the union can, can, can put in place and also that individual journalists can take? Um, I, again, I think we, we have to uh, do a lot, of, a lot of more training um, because the, the, sometimes even the language we use, uh, we just use it because we are used to, to use that language but we are not uh, perfectly aware of uh, the implications uh, a designated term has or the other. Uh, and if we, if we promote uh, uh, trainings that, uh, that promote equality and diversity, there are several projects that have been doing this. Uh, at some point, the Council of Europe had something called Median, and it was exactly directed to media and to diversity in media inclusiveness in media and this is something that uh, if you if you start doing it it will take some time because it's also a, a profession uh, that um, uses r routines you know uh, does things uh, the same way for <laughs> for centuries it's it adapts not very easily to 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 changes like that uh, i just want to say that you know some years ago it's true like 10 years ago i did a, a little survey on the place i used to work not the, the one i work now um, 15 15 years and i asked uh, women journalists there if they have ever been discriminated while doing their jobs and all of them said no. They, they had no case of uh, so general question, have you been discriminated? No. Then I asked concrete questions, even on sexual harassment, and there, were, there was a yes answer. So the same person that said I was sexually harassed didn't perceive it as discrimination, which is this is amazing, no? I mean, it's, it's very challenging. Because then people don't receive it and they, they don't want to point it out most of the time, especially on TV. You don't want to say anything, even if you were arrested in any kind of uh, way. You don't want that to, to be in your curriculum because then you know, you, your, you know your path will be somehow blocked in the way. And, um, and this is, it's very challenging. It's, uh, it's not, I, I wouldn't say, it's, it's not a job uh, where uh, women are very active on defending uh, uh, issues like uh, gender equality or even violence against women or uh, sexual harassment. It's not, um, it's not something they look forward to, to do. Thank you. Jyoti, are you still with us? Very, very quickly, because we're really reaching the, the very end now. Jyoti, are you still there? Uh, I see her. Okay, I don't hear her though. Okay, so well, perhaps the time has. Hello. Oh, Jossie, are you there? Yes. It was just a final comment from each of the speakers around the issue of um, violence and sexual harassment. How does your union work to protect your members, who you know, in the informal economy, must really face quite a lot of that? I think, uh, of course, this is very important because we being a women's union, of course, in our union, there are only women at all level. But of course, we are very much worried in terms of the, uh, the violence, which is harassment and violence, which is taking place at the workplace. That is very important to us. And I think we very much believe because we wanted to involve this to be, while we do a organi investment in the process of organizing. We believe in building a, a value-based collective organized strength for our members uh, so that they could fight for the harassment and the sexual harassment at the workplace. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, 
I think we've, we've heard a lot today from different parts of the world, different women leaders really laying out for us what are the building blocks of what a gender equal new normal must look like. And as was said at the first webinar we had um, by the moderator then, Chidi King, said that we, we actually have to start now. The new normal is, is already here with us. It's not coming tomorrow or the year after or the month later. It's here now. So the building blocks have to be put in place now. The unions have to act now. If we're changing rules, we need to start changing them now. If we're changing the culture, we need to start making those changes happen now. And the purpose of, the, of these webinars have been for the global unions uh, and their members to come together to find ways to speak together and make sure that all the gains we've made so far, the demands that have been made so far and for so very long, are taken very seriously and moved forward now in this critical moment, which is really a critical moment for, for changing the world. It's, it sounds idealistic perhaps and, and you know, uh, blue skies thinking, but I really think that the sense of urgency that Maria referred to and the fact that it's an emergency in the same way that we've seen governments able to respond to this health emergency, we want them to respond to the emergency of gender inequalities and the intersections of gender inequalities with other forms of inequalities. So it remains simply for me to say thank you very much to all of our speakers for taking the time to do this. A very big thank you to all of the participants who joined us. A massive thank you to the technical team and to the interpreters. An even bigger thank you, the thank yous are just getting bigger and bigger, but an even bigger thank you to my um, colleagues at the Global Union Federations, without whose work we wouldn't have been able to all join together to have these conversations. So we leave you with a call for action. Each and every single one of us can take some form of action to make the gender equal, gender, the new normal, a gender equal new normal. Thank you very much.